All right, I got Yogi Aaron on the show today. He is a master yoga teacher and muscle specialist. He's also the author of Stop Stretching. Yogi Aaron, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you so much. I I love everything that you're doing. Um, and I love like the whole idea of like biohacks and how to help us. And when I saw that, I just wanted to quickly tell you for the very first time today, I actually went into cryotherapy. So I went and got frozen for three, uh, three minutes. <laughs> how do you feel? Well, first of all, it wasn't as traumatic as I thought it might be. I hate being cold, like in the worst way. And um, I've been actually feeling like I just did some like heavy duty drugs or something because I've been just wired ever since then. <laughs> it's going to be your new podcast uh, pre like routine now. <laughs> exactly. Got to prepare for Joel Evan. I hate the cold myself. So I bought a cold plunge because I was like, I'm, I'm going to suffer daily because I'm, I'm weak. I don't like the fact that I, I hate, I absolutely have this aversion for the cold. So I, I'm like, you know what, what better way than to, to actually get one and uh, yeah, do it regularly. And you know, you get like a 500%, you said drugs. It's funny. They, they actually, the studies show you get like a 500% increase in dopamine. So you talk about your brain turning on, like there's no wonder that three minutes you're like, man, I feel great. Like I'm ready to go. So, all right, man, let's jump into things. I, I felt amazing. Yeah. Yep. Let's jump into things. I want to get straight to the chase with you. You're telling me that stretching is killing us and that I should stop stretching. Like that's not what I learned in PE class, Aaron, when I was in eighth grade or seventh grade. <laughs> Matter of fact, they still teach. And I think this is kind of wrong. They, they teach a lot of static stretching before. Yeah you even start something. And I, and I, and I've heard that that's like, not correct. You shouldn't do that. You should do this dynamic stretching. But what I get from you is just like, no, stop stretching altogether. Tell me why, how did you come up with this and why you're so adamant about it that you actually wrote a book about it and you want people to stop stretching and you're a yoga. Don't yoga people do downward dog. That's a stretch. So I can't <laughs> wait. Tell me why I'm wrong. So, Okay. Where do we start? You asked such a big load of questions. So I, when, I you, when you do, what I, when I talk about stretching, I'm really talking about passive stretching. Uh, anytime you kind of force a muscle to become longer and, you know, you can do that in a gentle way. You can do it in an aggressive way, but it all has the same effect. You can imagine that there's like a light switch in the muscles. The light is on, the muscle is strong, it works. And in the definition of muscle strength, we define it like a muscle that can contract and contract on demand. So when there's an outside force put on it, it will like work right away. If it's not working, the light switch is off, the muscle is weak. And when it's weak, you, you don't have the capacity, the muscle loses its capacity to stabilize your body. So a muscle has two jobs, stabilize joints, uh, and move bones. That's it. And it has to do that by shortening. Well, when we're stretching a muscle, what are we doing? We're forcing it to lengthen. So when we stretch a muscle, the short answer is we basically turn that light switch off. The muscle ceases to function. We continue to overstretch. It sounds like you're telling me that over time, it's just the, met, the, the, the connection, the brain neuromuscular connection, it gets lost. The connection it, starts to dwindle. There's not firing and, as fast as it normally would. Yeah, like one of my favorite party tricks is to get people to do like, you know, when you're on your back and you lift one leg up like 45 degrees, you lift the other leg up and then you lift both legs up. So we, I do a little hack because most people are weak. They can't do it. And I like to do this hack where it's a muscle activation hack and you get it to get them to turn the muscle on. And it's like I said, it's like literally turning on a light switch. You're building that neuromuscular connection. My favorite hack, though, is get them get them to turn the muscle on. They feel the muscle strong. We all agree. Everybody in the room, I can have a hundred, I can have a thousand people. Everybody will agree the muscle is strong. Then I get them to do like the pose that you should never do in yoga, which is child's pose, and I get them to do it like just for thirty seconds, not a long time, uh, and then I get them to do the ex exact same uh, thing again lift one leg, lift the other leg, lift both legs. And every single one of them not only says the muscle is weak, but it was weaker than when they first did the test. And so it's a really kind of like interesting test to do with people that they actually feel that experience of what it's like when a muscle is strong versus when a muscle is weak. And 
So I have a question to follow up to that because in my own journey from being injured multiple times and you know yep. doing jujitsu and CrossFit and getting hurt regularly and going to see ART specialists and chiropractors and uh, you know the great mobility guru out there Kelly Starrett, uh, you know I went and saw him. I saw everybody. I was like, "Fix me, please, help me!" Right? And but one of the things I always found interesting in my mobility routine or stretching routine is that sometimes when I would feel pain in an area, mm -hmm. I thought, oh, because Kelly Starrett taught everybody this, put a lacrosse ball in and roll it out. But yeah, Aaron, there's times in my life that I actually felt like I was actually just smashing the muscle and it yes. never got better. I thought it needed to get like loose. Yeah. What I would later find is that if I strengthened the muscle and I worked out on it, believe it or not, the muscle got strong and it yeah. didn't need to be stretched or smashed anymore. How does someone know you're nodding your head? So I'm wondering how does someone <laughs> know like myself, is there a way to know like this muscle should be mobilized or stretched or this muscle needs to be strengthened? It's, it's weak. How do we know? Well, that's a, I mean, it's, it's a difficult thing to answer because first of all, there is an intuitive idea or a sense like, for example, if I have a sore shoulder, you know, it's like, it feels good to kind of like rub it out. Okay. And the simple answer to why that might feel good, there's a few answers I could give, but one of them, <laughs> I kind of call it the law of distraction. So, uh -huh. you know, it's kind of like, I feel pain. And if I like rub it enough, guess what? All of your neuro connection is going to that spot it's no longer focused on the pain. So like when you were a kid and you fell down and then mommy said, okay, I'm going to kiss you to make it better. It's not the kiss made it better. It's like you were distracted by that kiss, right? Yep. So um, I, the, the biggest way that I can describe this, I went to an acupuncturist. I was having pain in my hip, like really bad pain. And in my, in my hip and lower back, and I was in Mexico City at the time, and I got a referral to go to this acupuncturist, and he stuck some needles in me. And at the end, he goes, do you feel better? And I said, not really. So he took, he took a needle and dug it into my scapula, in my scapula. <laughs> and he said, this is the point for the lower back. And of course, me being, you know, I was like, oh, that's really cool. And <laughs> so, so he just kept like rubbing the needle and he goes, how's the pain? And he goes, I said, well, it's like drop from like a six out of 10 to maybe a three out of 10. He wiggled it some more. And I said, well, now it's dropped down to like a one. And did it help in that moment? Yeah, because I wasn't focused on my lower back, my brain was now connected to that spot. And so it's kind of like a little bit of art of trickery. Now, in fairness to that acupuncture and to everybody else, they don't know that they don't understand the law of distraction. So, you know, I'm trying to say this with as much humility as I can and compassion, but it, that's what it is essentially. And so what we want to do, though, is get that system stronger. And I think that your intuition of realizing like, yeah, you can rub on that, sorry, you can roll on that ball and it will feel good, but it's not really solving the problem. The problem is, is that the origin of that pain is a result of stress, okay? So when you have stress in a joint, the biomechanical response is inflammation, right? And so it, the, infl the stress is there because the joint isn't being, um, supported properly. So you want to make sure that like, the muscles surrounding that joint are working, neuromuscularly working. So a lot of people, like when they hear that, they go, oh, I need to go work out more. I need to lift more weights. No, that actually could have a more detrimental effect. What we want to do is start improving that neuromuscular connection. And, and the how is kind of this, the short answer is through isometrics. Um, getting the muscles to start connecting uh, by getting them to contract uh, for short periods of time. And that will start to build that neuromuscular connection. You just said that all acupuncture is worthless and doesn't do anything. Is that right? No, 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 no. There's some really good acupuncturists out there. That's a whole, I have a whole conversation about that. Okay. But um, it's, yeah, no. <laughs> I, know, I know what you mean, though. There, I 100% I, I understand what you're saying. There's sometimes where it's just a distraction. And so, like you said, when the brain focuses on 
when it's stuck in that neuro pain feedback loop, it focuses on this one thing. When you distract it for a little bit, it's like, oh, I'm no longer in it. So I don't even, I'm not even thinking about it. So yeah, totally, I, I can totally understand that. Um, I'm just wondering it, but I, I, would you say, and from my understanding, like when we're rolling things out, we are yeah. moving, changing the fascia, aren't we? And like water and fluid inside the fascia is moving around. So there is some effect. Is it permanent? No, that's why I'd be rolling every freaking day. But there is some positive effects. Yes. Or do you not roll or because it's the same thing as a poor man's massage, is it not? So you don't do you not do any rolling or anything like that? Yeah. So with, with rolling, I mean, here's the thing. People that are rolling are always rolling. <laughs> you know, and ne again, it just never solves the problem. And, you know, you can always say, well, if it feels good, do it. You know, this is the kind of cop out that even doctors use, you know, well, if it makes you feel good, do it. My response is a line of cocaine will make you feel good. That doesn't necessarily mean that you should do it, right? So yeah. just because you can doesn't mean that you always uh, should. What I would say to someone who like is like, well, you know, does rolling help? Like you, you kind of brought up an interesting point. You're moving stuff. Are you really? I mean, are you really moving stuff? I mean, it, maybe you might think you are, but are you really? And then the, mo the other important question to ask is, is actually rolling on a ball, is it actually making your muscles stronger or weaker? And so if there's like a lot of inflammation there and you're digging into that spot, are you actually going to create more inflammation? Um, and so that's the question that like, I think it's really important. Is this practice, is this workout making me stronger or weaker? And the, the the perspective that I come at it is neuromuscularly. Is this improving that neuromuscular connection or is it making it weaker? So in my opinion, and, and this is just my humble opinion, I've never seen anybody roll on something and actually get stronger as a result. Um, I, I, I would actually err more on the side of weaker. Maybe it helps short term, but do yeah. you ever get to the root cause? And like you said, you're always rolling for life. Like, how yes. about we just fix you like once and for the most part, you just come see me once a year or something because you need to get yeah. activated, which we'll talk about some of your muscle activation techniques. Um, yeah. And I just want to quickly add that I've worked with, you know, at this time, thousands of people and every single one of those people was stretching and rolling on things, you know, and, and going to these stretching clinics and doing all of this stuff because, yeah, they felt good in the moment, but they always regressed like the next day or the next hour, the next couple of hours to their pain. So I've never, ever, ever met anybody in my whole career who has rolled um, or stretched and has actually gotten stronger as a result. Big question is, if you, if you get pain or whatever, right? You got some neck pain, common, yeah. right? Stress, like you said, all of us, man, we're stressed. Maybe we're in a hunched position all day because we're stressed and we're typing, I don't know. What is, what does Yogi Aaron do? What do you do then to fix it? You know, smashing doesn't work. You know, stretching doesn't work. So <laughs> a cryotherapy, what do you do, Aaron? <laughs> well, the cryo is, is a new, is a new hobby. So I'll let you know how it goes, but you know, that's a really good question. Um, so one of the things that we have to ask ourselves is why are our muscles tight? And, you know, I, I have my own story, but the short version is after 25 years of teaching and practicing yoga intensely, not one teacher ever came up to me to say, why are your muscles tight? Like I got into yoga because of my tight hamstrings, right? Um, also because of neck issues. I, I had horrible chronic, like I'm talking nine out of 10 level pain in my neck. So muscles tighten up as a protective mechanism. If somebody's traps are tight, it's because the body senses instability and it's trying to like hold your neck in place. Now, you said earlier, like, you know, somebody's hunched over their computer, they're kind of sitting slouched. And so, you know, if you move your head, your head weighs about 10 pounds, right? So your spine is holding your head up. You come forward with your head one degree, you've added on 10 pounds. You come forward five degrees, you've now ha added 50 pounds. And so 
all of the muscles in the upper back are holding 50 pounds, you know, of, of weight. And that's going to really start to tighten up uh, the, the upper part of the neck muscles, mostly like the upper traps, right? So if you want to get those muscles like loosen, number one, start to sit up properly <laughs> as much as you can. But two, where we want to go and what I try to teach people, it, it, which is not easy, but go to the opposite muscle. So in the hamstrings, for example, if the hamstrings are tightening up, it's a result of the hip flexors not working. It's a result of your quads not engaging properly. Now, again, that doesn't mean that you should go run out and do like a bunch of leg squats. That actually probably will make it weaker or like, you know, leg extensions. No, you want to do some simple activations to get those muscles turn back on. And as soon as they turn on, the interesting thing is the hamstring tightness basically disappears. So in the case of like your neck, you know, the, you want to look to the up opposite muscles. A lot of people, by the way, like if I tested a thousand people's traps, you would be surprised to learn probably a thousand of them are going to be weak. Most people are walking around with weak traps. Again, when I say weak, I'm talking about muscles that don't contract properly. They don't contract and contract on demand. So what we want to do is get the traps actually working. The opposite muscle, by the way, to the upper traps is the lower traps. They're agonist and they have this opposite relationship. So for your listeners to understand, when one muscle is contracting, the opposite muscle is relaxing. And so there's every single muscle has this relationship. And so if you have a tight muscle, chances are that the opposite one isn't contracting properly. Well, right now I have a extremely tight right trap. So I'm already, you gave me some great ideas of things I could do. I want to move so in. So you want to do a quick hack? Just, Let's do it. Just bring your arms up to the sky. Bring your arms like a V. Now really keep your, because you're, you're doing this like sitting, right? So you want to keep your spine as, as stable as possible. But now with your arms at a V, just drive your thumbs back like one inch or half an inch. Do you feel your lower traps engaging? And then relax. And then do it again. Bring them up. And then just bring them back. Do you feel your lower traps? Yeah. Yeah. So this is, a, this is one of my very simple and then relax and then do it again. So this is my very simple hack to activate the lower trap. Sometimes when I'm working out in the gym, I'll, I'll do some different exercises, relax. We'll do it just one more time. Normally we do it six, but bring them up again and then just take the thumbs back again. Don't extend your upper chest. Just bring the arms back ah. and, and then relax. And then you can do bring them back. That was good. That was a good cue. As soon as I brought it back, retracted, I could feel the engagement right then. Yeah, yeah. That was good. And so all of a sudden, like I do that hack with a lot of people and then they'll just be like, I've got more mobility in my neck. Yeah. Because your neck, you're not in that protective state. That's the thing like with tightness that a lot of people have a hard time wrapping their head around because we've been taught that tightness is bad. Tightness is actually not a bad thing. It's, it's your body's way of saying, Hey, I don't feel safe. I don't want to go there. I can't do that. If I go there, I'm going to be unstable. So your body's actually protecting itself. Um, the question is, is like, okay, well, there's this tightness. The tightness is a result of instability. Where's the source of that instability? Um, and that's where, it, for me, that's where it gets kind of interesting to root it out. Um, of like asymmetries. Like I know yeah. I have an asymmetry, right? Yeah. So to work on me, let's just use me as an example. And I would come see you, I don't know, once a week, right? Yep. Would the protocol then be, we would be retesting because it's going to take time for these symmet to become more symmetrical over time. My, I got one hit, I got a hip hike. I got, I got issues, right? So then my, you know, we have that um, cro upper cross syndrome that people know about. I think a lot of us are experienced that in this modern world. I was a former police officer. So the gun belt completely wrecked me, all these things, right? So over time though, I'm sure as you're testing me and testing me, certain muscles are, you're going to get them to fire. Then yes. you can move to the next area and get them yeah. to fire. And then it, over time, Aaron, do you just see that people just balance out naturally because we got things firing again? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you just get stronger and stronger. There's kind of like two things that kind of have to happen simultaneously. One, you know, you work with me or, you know, you do my class or whatever, and you, and you feel stronger. You need to keep doing like little things. So the more like you're doing stuff on your own. And, and when I say doing stuff on your own, I always tell people, if you can do like eight minutes of of spending time with yourself, just do some muscle activations on your own every day. What will start to happen is you'll start to get stronger neurologically. Um, and so the reason why muscles start to shut down is always because of stress, trauma, and overuse. So let's like use you. You just said that you were a police officer before and you were carrying that gun belt. And so you had all of this weight and you probably... I'm just going to throw this out there. I don't know this for a fact, but you probably were compromised somewhere already. Like you were compromised maybe in your, your core muscles. You were probably compromised in your back muscles. And so other muscles start to take over. Other muscles that had no business maintaining stability. All of a sudden, one day, your body just goes enough and starts tightening up as, as a result. Like it's yeah. just tightening up because it's trying to protect itself. And so that stress of carrying that stuff around, you know, became like you overused those muscles and they just start to shut down. When we start to work together, what we're doing is rebuilding that neuromuscular connection, number one. But number two, we're also increasing the stress tolerance of those that neuromuscular connection so it doesn't shut down in the future, right? It, it's going to yeah. stay strong. And that's what we're trying to do is, is build it up and then get it to become stronger. I was just thinking too about just the example that you, you highlighted is if like, Hey, you have neck pain, right? And yeah. I do the, the typical Kelly Starrett, no offense, K-Star, but I go ahead <laughs> and I take a lacrosse ball, I jam it in my neck. Cause I'm yeah. like, Oh, that feels so much better. K-Star yeah. was right. I feel better. I'm my, I'm looser. My sh yeah. hand, my arm goes over my shoulder. I'm perfect again. The problem, going back to what you just said with that, though, is it makes me feel better. Maybe I'm even moving better. Yeah. But I never did anything to that lower trap that is still the problem because we never yeah. addressed the root cause of the pain, which is what you took away by just having six simple activations. Can so I, yeah, go ahead. I wanted just to jump in because you just said something that's so freaking important that when you put the ball there, you may increase range of motion. You may increase your flexibility, but guess what? You have flexibility without stability. You know, you've, you, you've opened up a range of motion. The word I like to use is that there's no accountability. You've opened up this range of motion, but there's nothing really supporting you there. So as soon as you put a load on your arm, as soon as you put a load, as soon as you start to put stress there, guess what? Now it's actually going to become more tight because you've, you've opened up this range of motion. There's no accountability. You put more stress there and now it's going, the body is just going to tighten up. And we see this constantly. Like, you know, I used to have severe neck problems and I used to stretch it out all the time. Guess what? My neck got worse and worse and worse. And so it's really important to address the root cause of that tightness again. Um, what muscles aren't working, get those stronger. And all of a sudden the tightness starts to disappear. I want to jump into some of these muscle activations that you talked about and you already kind of shared some with us. But before I do, before we go there, one last question. When do we stretch then? When would it be appropriate in your mind? Okay, I will let you stretch. Um, as my shirt says, stop stretching. <laughs> yeah, the guy who wrote a book says stop stretching. Is there ever a time that we could stretch or should stretch. I mean, listen, I, I want to ask you this too, because, you know, I grew up in a, in a, I'm 41. I grew up in a time where, you know, watching these martial arts movies and yeah. karate kid, and you know, it was a big deal to do the splits like Van Damme. Yeah. Now I'm thinking, and I need to ask you, it's like, does that matter? Is that a good thing? Like, should we all, should we, should we be able to be that flexible? Is that even a good thing to strive for? I mean, I don't know. Yeah. So I, there's like a lot to unpack there, but <laughs> with a lot of martial arts and, and this is, I'm making a broad stroke here. So don't, don't take this as the ultimate truth, but a lot of martial arts from what I've seen is built by what we actually call dynamic stretching or dynamic movement. So, you know, you never see 
typically a lot of martial arts people grabbing their foot and trying to stretch themselves. They actually will like balance themselves and raise the leg. That's a very dynamic movement. There's a lot of accountability. Another way of saying this is like, if I ask you to bring your hand up to behind your back, right? And don't grab your shirt or try and pull it down. But right now you're dynamically moving that hand behind your back, correct? But yeah. if you take your other hand now and bring it to your elbow and just don't, don't actually do this, but yeah. if you pushed that hand further down, you could probably get about six inches of movement, right? You yeah. could probably get six inches of range of motion. There is no accountability there. So what I'm teaching people to do is actually move dynamically, which is what I kind of glean from a lot of martial arts kind of movement. There's a lot of dynamic movement. And when you're doing that, you're actually building that, that neuromuscular connection in a great way. If you do it enough and you keep doing it repetitively um, and systematically without causing your body a lot of stress, you're actually going to start not only creating more stability, you're going to create enormous range of motion, which is why those guys have what we perceive of as a lot of uh, flexibility. So to answer your question, though, when should you could you stretch? When should you stretch? Let me just say this. Stop stretching. But there is like, you know, I would say the problem is as soon as I start saying there, there's an exception, people make it the rule. Yeah. And so what I will just say is this, if you are going to do any kind of stretching and for me that there's a couple of like little things I will do um, that are sort of what I usually call passive, right? Uh, let me give you one example. One of my favorite poses in the yoga world to do is a pose called Sphinx pose. Sphinx pose is when you're on your stomach and it's kind of like Cobra, but you just bring your elbows underneath your shoulders and mm -hmm. you kind of just hang out there like a Sphinx. And so that's a very kind of passive pose in some, in a very gentle way, you are doing some stretching. I like this pose because it, one of the biggest problems that a lot of people have is that there's no lumbar curve in people's spines. So if I teach that pose, and I often will, I always do it at the very beginning, because if I do something passive, I want to make sure that it's followed by a lot of things to start activating those muscles. I put the curve mm -hmm. into the spine. You now let's get the muscles activated. So that's the general rule. If you're going to do any kind of gentle, simple stretch, do it at the very beginning if you must. Um, but generally speaking, I, I, there's very few stretches. I don't teach stretching anymore. Just no. Yeah. Just stop. <laughs> okay. Really, really cool. All right. Let's jump into this muscle activation techniques. Why is it work? Uh, and I'm really curious to learn more about it. Um, one thing I will say is I, I think I might understand this, but I don't know. I got certified in this electric stim therapy about three, four years ago. And mm -hmm. the creator of the heating, um, create he, um, this DC electric current is been around this type of therapy has been around for a while, but he's really taken it to a different level. And one of the things he taught in our certification was muscle activation prior to doing any of the, the stem work. And he said, man, I just, I've noticed it does so much more. The results are so much more stickier and long lasting and people get better faster. Yes. And so he will evaluate people's bodies, do a little bit of muscle activation. It, when you do it, Aaron, and I don't know what this, if it's the same stuff, it, it's some, I could give an example. It would be like me rubbing on your sternum. That could yeah. be one to like for the diaphragm. Anybody that's maybe is thinking of this is like, what would that ever do? Are you kidding me, Joel? Like that's going to have a downstream effect. But again, his, what he's seen, at least in his, in his, you know, clientele is that it works way better. Anyways, talk to me about muscle activation, why it works. And what does it look like if someone has no idea what we're talking about? So just, just very quickly, my background, I started studying with Greg Roscoff, who created muscle activation technique and, or otherwise known as MAT. And he has a school outside of Denver. When I got into that, I got into it for a couple of reasons. One, just to kind of grow my own knowledge. I felt like I needed to grow as a yoga teacher in my anatomy and what it completely blew my mind uh, on so many levels. But one of the things that I I felt like 
it was actually the thing that I felt like was missing in the world of yoga. So nobody in the MAT world that I knew of was translating this into yoga and bringing it into the yoga world. So that's how I came up with Ayama, Applied Yoga Anatomy and Muscle Activation. And so how, so to answer your question first, muscle activation. So there's a couple of different ways that you can start to activate muscles. You mentioned the uh, e-stem, so using electronic current. Um, that's a whole discussion in and of itself, um, which I don't really want to broach because that's not really the lane that I drive in. No, I don't want to go there either. I the, only so, wanted to highlight the, the MAT. Yeah, suffice yeah. it to say, the second way is to manually do it. And this is probably, you know, in some in some areas, probably the most effective way is that you go in and you have uh, someone who knows what they're doing um, stimulate the origin and insertion of muscles. And so at those points, that's where all the nerves are, right? And so when you stimulate those points, you're starting to stimulate what's called gamma motor neuron coactivation. That's the That's the communication system from the muscle to the central nervous system. The third way, which is the lane that I really drive in with the yama, is through isometrics. And so like when we had our arms brought up, right? And we're bringing the arms back, what we're doing is we're starting to target specifically the lower traps. We're probably activating a few other muscles. We're shortening those muscles. And by shortening them, it starts to stimulate the intrafusal muscle fibers, which then stimulates that co muscle um, gamma motor neuron coactivation. The rule when you're doing isometrics, number one rule, less is more. <laughs> Aaron, so, say that one more time because I'm a hardhead and I always I'll think say it more for the better. cheap seats in the back. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is, less is more. I cannot repeat this enough. I mean, you know, it really... Because I actually come from the school of hard knocks. You know, I went to an old boys boarding school. We used to snowshoe for 50 miles. And, um, and the teachers would tell us, you know, no pain, no gain. Suck it up, you know. <laughs> so I I, that's been a hard one for me to understand. But really and sincerely, the last thing you want to do is create more stress. So you want to do the less is more. But coming back, so less is more. Um, and then another rule is six seconds, six times. So when I did this with you, we actually did it four. Um, but the ideal account is hold it for six seconds and repeat it six times. So whenever you're doing kind of an isometric and targeting some muscles, six seconds, six times. I'll tell you another muscle activation, which is really cool. Um, you just cross your arms, you lift your chest, and you got to keep your hips locked. So if you're sitting in a chair or sitting on the floor, don't move your hips but just rotate as much as you can to one side. And now you're targeting all of the oblique muscles and then come back. And then you would do that six seconds, six times. One of my uh, favorite little party tricks, and I'll do this with you know new people sometimes, is have them kind of like standing and hands on their hips, maybe legs just a bit wider than hip distance or a little bit wider. And then just fold forward with a really extended spine. So don't like round and fold forward, just fold forward as much as you can. And then you do this uh, six seconds, six times on each side. And, mm. and what happens is, so the obliques are rotators. The, the um, anterior obliques are rotators. So they control rotation of the spine. They're actually some of the most important muscles, but they're also flexors. And so what, when you do this with people, they often will notice that they're not only the tightness in their hamstrings has disappeared. Remember, tightness is a protective mechanism. So if your trunk flex, flexors, your aka your obliques aren't working properly, that neuromuscular connection isn't there, your hamstrings as you fold forward are going to tighten up. But what's interesting, as soon as you get the obliques working, you fold forward the tightness in the hamstrings disappears. And the first time I did that, I was like, what the F is going on? Um, how did that happen? Because I didn't even touch my hamstrings. I didn't do anything with my legs, right? Uh, so anyways, that's another like little muscle activation that you can do. What about isometrics and why you're such a huge fan? And I'm, and I'm guessing just from all the books that I've read about the brain and how the brain works is that when we are trying to create a new pattern, right? And we've got, and you mentioned like muscles, 
um, not firing. Like the signal's just not going. The brain is no yeah. longer even sending the signal sometimes. And so it seems, and it's my hypothesis, but I'm sure you already know the answer, is that when we're doing isometrics, we are really creating that firing response, that conscious thought in the brain, like this is what's being stimulated and we're targeting it so that we can build that neural pathway back. And it's going to cement and embed in memory way better than if I just did some kind of like 50 reps or whatever. What, what's your thought on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, there's... I don't know, like we're building new pathways. I think we're reinforcing the pathways that were already there. Um, the problem is, is like you said, you made a comment. You said maybe the brain isn't even sending messages. So there's a, there's one of the biomechanical words is proprioception, you know, and in, the, in yoga, which is the lane that I drive in the most or have been driving in, a lot of what we talk about in yoga is this mind-body connection. And so if you're a student and I say, like, feel your pinky toe, okay, like most people don't even know or sense where their pinky toe is. That's like a kinetic tactile connection that we're building. That's valuable. But what I'm actually approaching it at, coming in at, coming in through it at is through sort of like the autonomic nervous system. Everything that's happening, like these muscles should be firing like in a like in a nanosecond, like when that muscle senses, like the muscle spindle sense, like, Hey, we need to contract. It sends a message to the brain and the brain sends a message back like in a nanosecond of it took me to explain that. So it's, it's happening like this. And if it's not happening like this, the muscle is therefore weak. And so what we're doing is reinforcing these neuromuscular connections that have been compromised due to stress, trauma, and overuse. So when we're doing isometrics, what we're doing is reinforcing that neuromuscular connection so it doesn't uh, break down. One little thing I wanted to mention, when I first started working out, it, you know, when I was back, when I was a, like a wee lad, uh, I was 13, 14. One of the things that I was taught incessantly is always do the first few, you know, one or two sets, lightweights and go really slow. And so what you start to see in the gym, you go to the gym, you watch other people, they're moving so fast, they're moving dynamically and which is fine. But when we move slow, what we're actually starting to target is this, what we call the slow twitch muscle fibers. And if we're not targeting those, we're only going to start strengthening our fast twitch muscle fibers. But it's the slow twitch that has that response to contract and contract on demand. It's the slow twitch that actually stabilizes the joints. And so we only can do that if we're moving slowly, following the less is more. <laughs> And, and really, and, but I, I do want to drive home a point that you made is actually feeling it, like have a tactile sense of feeling it. that is also equally important. I'll just give you one quick example. So one of the things I do is just one armed, uh, bench pressing. It's something that I've been kind of playing with a lot, but I will take my other hand on my pec and I usually use about maybe 30 pounds or so. And I move really slowly and I bring the, the, the um, barbell, sorry, not the barbell, the dumbbell up. And I really feel my pec engaging, but I also move really slowly. And I'm very mindful of my range of motion and honoring that. So slow down is one of the key things here. Really mm -hmm. take time to feel what you're doing. And for like professional or elite athletes, I mean, I'm sure you see this. This has got to be a game changer for them. Yeah. They're already at the height of their game and they probably compensate really well because they're just machines, but they come see you and they get a quick tune up. I mean, now they go fight in a, a, a fight, a match, or they go hit the, I mean, the sprinting, you know, whatever yeah. it is. Are you seeing that like immediate, like just big differences, especially in an elite athlete? I'm imagining when things turn on, like the gap is enormous. Like you can, it's <laughs> tangible. You can see it, right? Or yeah. how does it, yeah, what do you see? Well, I mean, definitely people, I wouldn't say that muscle activation necessarily makes you, you know, be able to lift more per se, but it makes you avoid injuries. And you see, I work a lot with um, people who are bodybuilders who are lifting enormous weights. And one of the things that I constantly see, they're weak. Like I just told you about the traps. 
you know, they can, they can move a lot of weight, but it's not, their traps aren't working. And because their traps aren't working when they're doing these enormous weights, they're putting stress on their joint and then they end up in a lot of pain. And it's horrible to see like how many of them are trying to stretch it out because, you know, momentarily it feels good, but then they stretch it out and then they're going back to do the, you know, lift these enormous loads without any muscles working. And so again, it just, it, it prevents injuries. Like people just work out, they feel stronger. And most importantly, they don't get injured. What would you say? Is that the most common thing you see is the weak traps just in general from like, you know, a, a week's worth of clients. Like, is it like, you're like, Oh, this again, is this like, what do you typically see from people? I'm curious. Um, the biggest, so the number one weakness I would probably say in people is their core. Ah. Their core, their 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 transverse abs and their obliques are not working at all. Um, the other big thing I often Aaron, see- Aaron, when you say the core, you're talking about like that pelvic floor, right? No. Well, that's another conversation, but I'm okay. talking about like transverse abdominis, the six pack or eight pack, the rectus abdominis, um, just all the core muscles. Most people are walking around with these guys not working, which is yeah. putting a lot of stress on their back. And the, like the wrong approach that a lot of people are taking to get their core working is by doing a lot of um, ab workouts. And that stuff just is not working. And so what you got to do is just slow it down, you know, learn to isolate, um, pick up my book, stop stretching. I have great th ways to build the core. But the other area uh, that most people are weak is hip flexors, which in turn relates to the pelvic floor. Um, and the opposite muscle. So a lot of like, if you go on social media, you search so as, or you click a like on a so as you, you're, you will be flooded with like all these hacks to get rid of tight. So as, and it's basically stretching it, which is the worst thing that you can do. Don't stretch your so as you need to get it turned on. Um, and so if the solution to it's tight. So as number one, turn it on, get it working. But number two, this is something that most people don't know. And I'm on a mission to get people to know this. The opposite muscle to the so as is the glutes. And so, you know, when you're sitting for a long time, people are always saying like, oh, you're sitting, you're forcing your so as to shorten. It's like, that's not the reason why your so as is tightening up. Your so as is tightening up because your glutes aren't firing at all. So getting the glutes to also start working is really important. And the simple way to start, <laughs> to start getting the glutes to work is like, you know, bridge pose, bridge pose is a great, shells. you know, clamshells, bridge pose. Those are two awesome exercises. When you do bridge, bring your arms out to the side. So you're not using your arms to, you know, lift your, your hips up. Take your arms out of the equation and really focus on squeezing those glutes, getting them engaging. That will start to get rid of your tight so out. Glute amnesia, my butt fell asleep. And I've been told that numerous times. Joel, you have a weak glute medius. This yeah. is why you're feeling pain in your hip and your lower, your QL and all this stuff. But I will tell you this, Aaron, and I've done the clamshells and I've done their little things. And it never, ever sustained. But yeah. I will say this. I never did muscle activation, which is different. Some of yeah. the techniques you're talking about, there's a different component of it than just go out and do more clamshells, Joel. And I will <laughs> say this. I never did isometrics clamshells. So, yeah, I mean, would you agree, though, that there, there's more to than just clamshells and a, a bridge pose? There's well, into what you're doing, too. I So there's a couple of things to say. But number one, if... Some people ask me, like, can I do muscle activation as a substitute for exercise? And and will my muscles get stronger or bigger or whatever? And my kind of explanation is like if you're if you're working out and your muscles aren't working properly, meaning that neuromuscular connection isn't working, you're gonna create more stress, which in turn is going to create more muscle tightness, which is gonna create more weakness ultimately. If you do muscle activations and you make sure that your muscles are working and you do, you know, I work out for an hour. I spend probably the first 30 minutes like doing a mixture of muscle activations and isometrics and slow movement. And then I sometimes will hit it hard, harder with some other stuff. But the other stuff that I'm doing is more general stuff. You know, like I'm not 
so much targeting. I'm doing more general things like lat pull downs and that sort of thing. So if you're going into your workout week, you're going to come out of your workout even weaker. Yeah. If you come into your workout stronger, you're going to end up stronger. And I want to just say one other thing. If you go into life week, and you're moving around life, at the end of the day, you're going to feel weak. And the next morning, you're going to wake up tight. If you go into your day stronger, you're going to end your day stronger. And that's something that's really important. So with the clamshells, what I kind of, and I'm going to make an assumption, I don't know for yeah. sure, but I'm going to assume you didn't go into your clamshells with like, okay, let's see if I can activate my mid glutes. You probably went into it like, I want a really nice butt. <laughs> no, I, I went into it, not, or, I wasn't as conscious. I was yeah. just like, hey, he gave me a list of things I need to do. I'm just going to do it. It was more of a checklist. Checklist, you know? yeah. Well, and so I didn't speak to you, but I see a lot of people in my gym, you know, doing clamshells. And when I say clamshells, they're like, you know, a one, a two, a three. You it's know? A, it's a Suzanne Summers, and, yeah, it's a <laughs> kind of workout going on. But I, I just want to say the clamshells, and, and I kind of tweak it a little bit, but the clamshells are great to get rid of pain in the piriformis. A uh. lot of people have pain in their piriformis and clamshells are really great to start activating the, the glute med, which in turn supports um, the piriformis. The piriformis is in pain usually because it's overworking and it's doing the job of the glutes. So getting your glute med working in clamshells is fantastic and it will really help uh, people that are, are dealing with piriformis issues. Because a lot of piriformis issues, excuse me, <clears throat> come, you hear a lot of people with sciatica, right? Yes. That have tight piriform, and they don't know, right? The Western doc says, you have sciatica. And they're like, oh my yeah. God, what am I going to do? It's like, yeah, you have a silly, Aaron right here just gave you the, just do some clamshells. <laughs> do some yes. glute activation. Maybe your sciatica goes away. You don't need surgery. Like, let's just get to the root cause here. No, you can avoid surgery all, most of the time. I'm not going to say all the time because some people, you know, um, I had a friend who had, you know, not only a herniated disc, but arthritis in his, his lumbar spine. And, um, of course he kept stretching. I think if, if he had worked with me a year earlier, I probably could have avoided it. But, you know, most of the time I would say, I know I avoided surgery. Um, I, you know, I had an orthopedic, I ended up in the emergency room of a hospital An orthopedic surgeon told me you're going to need a spinal fusion. Um, and I, to this day, you know, almost seven years later, I haven't had a spinal fusion. So I would just say like, there is hope. You just got to do the work and, 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 and do the muscle activations and, and invest in reversing some of the damage that we've done to our bodies. By the way, if someone's listening to this and they're just like, their mind's being blown and they want to work with you, are they able to work with you virtually? Are you able to assess people virtually and give them kind of a prescription or is it only locally where you're at? I, I, I tend to work with people more just through the courses that I'm doing, through the classes I'm doing. If somebody really wants a session with me, I will work with them individually. I also encourage people to come down since I'm in Costa Rica and I own a yoga retreat, come and see me on my yoga retreat on either one of my retreats or immersion trainings. Um, so I can, that's the best way to work with people. But yeah. I, I, absolutely, if somebody was in dire straits and wanted to work with me virtually, I can easily do um, a range of motion assessment with them and find out exactly where their problems are and, uh, and then be able to guide them into starting to fix themselves. The thing I would just stress again to people is it is a process. And, you know, usually I can get results. Like, I mean, I've had people come on my table uh hunched over in enormous pain. Like when I say pain, like eight, nine out of 10, and then leave like zero to one out of 10. So we can get rid of the pain sometimes very quickly. Uh, but it, it is a process, you know, it's, it's a process We're we're reestablishing that communication system in the body. And it takes a little bit of time. I want to wrap things up. I'm looking up at the time, but, um, before we wrap things up, just any exciting projects or anything that you're working on that you're excited about? Yeah, I'm really excited about this course that I've created for Yama. We've been talking a lot about this 
And my goal is to help as many people become pain-free as possible, uh, but not only become pain-free, be able to know what's going on. So you said to me earlier, like, I've got this pain in my shoulder. How do I deal with it? And what I want people to do is have the solutions at their fingertips instead of trying to rely always on other people for the answers. Arm yourself with knowledge. The body is an amazing mechanism. It's not as complicated as you think. And so I've created this course. You can learn to heal yourself. Uh, and then if you want to, you can go on and learn how to heal and help other people. Wow. And so this is full body. Yes. To heal yourself head to yes. toe. Amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Really cool. Really cool. Um, and then last but not least, man, just anything that I didn't ask you that, that you wish I had. Oh my goddess. Um, <laughs> we, 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 we covered well, a lot of you know, ground. We could always come back for a round two if there's some things yeah, we I missed. hope so. I hope that I hope this conversation is is sizzling enough. Uh, you didn't ask me where to get my book. Go to Instagram. I'm sorry, go to Amazon and you can find Stop Stretching there. But also I wanted to say to your listeners, if you feel compelled and you've been listening uh, so far up to this point. Contact me on Instagram. I'm available. Send me a DM. I'm happy to talk with you. Yogi Aaron, just yeah, where can we connect with you, learn more about you other than on Instagram? Is there a website? You have the book we know about. Anything else? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to send you, I'm going to give you a link if you can put it in your uh, show notes. Yep. People can access that link and get solutions to their pain today. They can also find me on yogiaron.com. I have a ton of like free content for people to take advantage of. So just go there and get solutions to your pain today. Stop stretching. Yogi Aaron, <laughs> thanks for being on the show, brother. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Joel. Love being here.